Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. Later on in the program, I'm going to be talking with Dave Kopel from the Independence Institute about drug and gun running to Mexico. Now, that's fun stuff. But first, a buddy of mine from that great station, 850 KOA, he's not a man, he's a loving machine. Michael Brown, thank you for joining us. Devil's advocate, I love that. It's just sitting here looking at you and yeah. seeing devil's advocate and those horns behind you, it's just like... Yeah. It's perfect. It's like, it's like you're coming home, isn't exactly. it? It's like you're coming home. <laughs> All right, before you became a world-renowned talk show host, taking up my time with the Rockies that. Right, games, right. The, you're pimping a great book, Deadly Indifference, The Perfect Political Storm. I want to, people know you in other areas as the Undersecretary for Homeland Security. You have 160 disasters under your belt. Right. Um, these aren't your old girlfriends. These are, these are natural disasters. These are terrorist acts. And right. what, what was your job? Well, interestingly, you know, the, one of the complaints about me was that I used to run the Arabian Horse Association and showed up, showed up and ran FEMA the next day. I actually went to the administration after the election of 2000, went to the administration as the general counsel of FEMA and served in that role for about, what, nine months until 9-11 happened. The president nominated me to be the deputy director of FEMA, and then I later became the de the uh, director of FEMA and the okay, undersecretary of Homeland Security. Yeah, and FEMA is the uh, Federal Emergency Management, Management of... uh, Agency, right. Okay. And so you, your job, if you put it in a nutshell, your job was when there was a hurricane, when there was a twister, when there was a flood, when there was a terrorist attack even, right. Right. you were there to make sure the aid and comfort and whatever needed to get there got there right afterwards. Right. Is, that, is that a good way to put it? That, that's a good way to put it, except I, I want to bring down expectations a little bit, because to bring aid and comfort, that's really what the locals right. do. And in our system of federalism, the role of FEMA, as originally envisioned by Jimmy Carter in 1979, was that we would be a coordinating agency. We would make sure that all of the departments and agencies of the federal government did what they were supposed to be doing, and then we would help train and organize state and locals as they responded to a disaster. So we were, we were kind of a coordinating body. The, um, the, the difference, though, is y you're remembered for one thing. Right. Katrina. Yes. Talk to me before that. Talk to me. What was your role in those 159 other disasters? How? I, I don't remember hearing that you did well, 159 well, other disasters. Right, because we uh, we did them successfully and quietly and, and under the radar screen. 9/11 is a great example. That was the first major disaster in the Bush administration. Our job was to bring all of the urban search and rescue teams in. We deployed all of them from around the country, including the one here in, in Colorado. They deployed to the Pentagon and to, the, and to Ground Zero. We also coordinated backfilling all the police and fire departments as everybody moved into lower Manhattan. And then we made certain that in the aftermath of the disaster, Congress appropriated $20 billion. And our job was to make sure that the $20 billion went to appropriately rebuild lower Manhattan and take care of the, of the government organizations, the public institutions that were damaged or destroyed, that we took care of those. The Columbia Space Shuttle example, the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster is a great example. Here is an agency, NASA, doesn't normally deal with disasters, and suddenly you have the space shuttle breaking apart uh, over the Pacific Ocean and literally spreading debris from California all the way through Texas. And so we stepped in and took NASA by the hand and said, we'll organize all of the, I mean, we called it a search and rescue, but we knew there was no rescue to it. We will organize the search for all of the pieces of debris, body parts, whatever we could find. And we did that in about an eight-state area. Uh, the any time there was a, a major wildfire breakout in Colorado or California, uh, the Mississippi flooding, we were always there to help coordinate the federal government's involvement into, to whatever extent they needed to be involved. Right, let, let's bring it to Katrina. Right. Because this, you, you will be forever remembered oh. and hooked to <laughs> Katrina. Yes. And I'm trying to figure out how fair that is. I know you're a bad person well, just, well, just because we're friends. Yeah. Uh, but, but professionally, I, I never thought you were, you, were, you were a bad person until I, I found out that, that, that you, I was a you bad caused, person. You right. caused I Katrina. caused the right. Let's talk about how that, how that uh, came about. I remember there was a hurricane. I remember the hurricane came, and I thought it went, and then a levee broke. Do I have that? You get it exactly right. All right. So the, the, everyone was worried. It looked like everything was fine. The wall broke and the flooding happened. And here's, and here's the major blame that I get that I find absolutely incredulous. Why didn't I evacuate the city of New Orleans? 
I have no authority. The President of the United States has no authority. That is the responsibility of a mayor and a governor under our system of government. Now, there came a point in Katrina, sitting on Air Force One, where I actually recommended to the President that we invoke the Insurrection Act, we waive posse comitatus, and we send troops into New Orleans to take over the police department, fire department, and everything else. You recommended this. I actually recommended Bush. that. Because things were so bad. The, the local and state governments were so dysfunctional in New Orleans, I recommended that we do that. I don't remember that ever happening in American it, and history. It, and, it, and it has not happened in American history. Why didn't George Bush take you up on that? He did, and then he made what I thought was an amazingly unusual decision for him. And I think it's in hindsight, I, I understand it, I still think it's unusual. George W. Bush was a governor. He understands, as I do and as I believe, governors are in control of their states. And we should respect that and do everything we can to protect their jurisdiction. So he turned to Kathleen Blanco, the governor at the time, and said, this is the recommendation the staff's given me, I'm going to follow it, but I want you to think about it. And she said, well, give me 24 hours. And she and realized that if she allowed this to occur or said she would acquiesce in it, she would write her political death mail. She may have anyway, but she said no, and so the president stepped back, and, and that's when we honored, brought in honor, honored the governor, honored the governor, okay. and brought in General Honoré to start doing the response. Tell me a little bit about Ray Nagin. Now, from <laughs> from my point of view as as a spectator to all this, yes. um, incompetence doesn't begin to even cover what I see. I I, I saw a goofball. Would that be the right way? I mean, no. That's that's very that's very uh, kind of you. I write in the book, which was obviously vetted by the publisher, uh, vetted by our lawyers. I told the truth. When I first landed at the Superdome, landed in a Black Hawk helicopter, a staff member comes running out to me and says, "Now you're going to meet the mayor, and we want to prepare you for that." And I'm thinking, "Prepare me to meet the mayor? I've met thousands of mayors." They said, "Well, he's." kind of in shock or something, we're not really sure. They had helped him. Whenever I would go into a disaster, I would turn to the governors and mayors and say, what do you need, how can I help? They had to sit down with him and help him write out what to tell me, to, you know, what to ask me for. I write in the book, John, that my first reaction, I, I, I sat down with this man, and in my mind I'm thinking, I'm dealing with a crackhead. Really? Yes, glazed over eyes, totally disconnected with reality, not a clue, I mean, partially in shock, I get that, but a guy that was just, well, as proven later, he wanted to rebuild the Chocolate City, he wanted to, uh, he wanted to know why these um, mysterious, unknown quantities of aid were over here and not being distributed to his people. I mean, it was all the most stereotypical garbage you could imagine. Now, he, he's, he's written his own book now. He's self-published a book, yes. Self -published a a, a book. publisher wouldn't touch it. And, and he's got some choice words for you. Well, he's, he's, he writes in his, in his self-published book that he believed that when I landed at the, in the Black Hawk helicopter that I was there with the CIA to assassinate him. And, and you were, right? I should have been. Right. <laughs> right, bring it, bring it to, to your entrance in this. How is it that you are now linked with Katrina? You know, it seems to me that I'm looking at levees that were not properly maintained. Right. I don't know if that was a state or a federal or a Both. local fish. Both. Uh, local all, all three of them. I see a mayor who was incompetent, right. who had buses who could have gotten people out, right. and he did not. That's correct. And I see a president that you know uh, took a huge PR hit because he was playing golf because he thought the storm had over, like right. all of us were. Right. What what failed, and what did FEMA do wrong or right? Well, I think for, first, and from a more strategic point of view, we have allowed expe expectations to get so high that there are too many people, this dependency culture in this country, that believes the federal government is going to show up when a flood, a tornado helps, and we're going to literally lift your butt out of that storm and save your rear end. And that is not the role of the federal government. It has never been. We will, in, in dire emergency situations like 9-11, we will, and like in Katrina, we, we dispatch the urban search and rescue teams. But that's all after the fact. Then what is the beef against you? What is it that that heck of a job, Brownie, now will be part of, part of the lexicon? In, in all honesty, it is this. The president and I, when that famous quote was, was stated on television. He and I had just finished meeting in a green room, well, not, it's not really a green room, but a, a room at this uh, Air National Guard base. And I had been explaining to the president, because it's the first time I'd seen him face to face since the storm had, had made landfall. 
And I'm explaining to him, look, boss, this is, this is horrible. Nothing's working. I can't even get the cabinet coordinated at this point. You know, Rumsfeld, who still is a good friend of mine, he's out in California doing something. Condi Rice is in New York shopping. They're, Chertoff's doing something in Atlanta. I don't know. I can't get them to pay attention to what's going on. That's what I'm telling him about how bad it is. And then he walks out when the public is seeing people in the Superdome, they're seeing all these things that the media is saying, look how bad it is, and then he tells me what a great job I'm doing. The media immediately connected that this guy, Brown, is a buddy of the president's. They're in cahoots with each other. Uh, the president is disconnected from reality of what's going on. We now have a person and a place in which we, the media, can now attack this administration. Was Bush indifferent to what was going on? Did he not understand the, I, the gravity of, of he, the situation? He didn't. I described a, um, it was either Monday or Tuesday after landfall, we had a civet, which is a secure conference call, back with the sit room at the White House. And at some point in that, when it first started, there was this, he told the cabinet members and the others, he said, he told everybody, literally, shut up, I want to hear what Brown says. Or, or so I want to hear what Brown said, and I repeat it again, Mr. President, it is my belief that 90% of New Orleans is underwater. We've lost this city, and I can't get things to happen. And there was that, you know what, seems like five minutes, but it's really like 15 seconds of silence where everybody's waiting for him to react. I think he, honest to God, this isn't meant to be critical. I think it's just a fact of life. He thought this was another hurricane. We had just done four hurricanes back to back in Florida. We had done all these floods. It's a hurricane. Brown will take care of it. And so he was disconnected from the reality of what was happening on the ground. If you were to go back into a, a time machine and get back there, when you got the call and you went there, I'm talking you personally. You can't control what Bush did. You can't control what Nagin did. Right. What would you do differently? Anything? Number one, and this, this may seem trite to people, but if you understand how important the media and communications is to everything that we do in this world, I would have stood at those typical press conferences where everybody crowds in to get behind the guy talking at the right. microphone, and I would have said, look, here's what's going on. This is a horrible disaster. Nothing is working the way it should be. I've got all of these materials and supplies lined up. They can't get into the city. The state is dysfunctional. We've lost the police department in New Orleans, which was corrupt anyway. So we had all of these problems. I would have told the American people exactly how bad it was. Instead, what do you do? You talk about how great everything's going. What does this tell you about political casualties? What's the big lesson when when something goes wrong, and things go wrong in politics, all the time. what happens? Well, somebody, somebody's, someone will be at the tip of the spear, and someone will take that spear, and you might as well just recognize that. And I saw it coming in the middle of the storm. I knew the train wreck was occurring. That's in other words, is. there's going to be a fall guy. Exactly. And you're it. Deadly indifference. Pick it up. Amazon.com. Stay tuned. This is going to be interesting. Michael, thank you. Thank you, John.